more, more information in the organic nutrient savings in the road dry. We have a lot of information available on our website. Uh, so Jody did, did a great job at putting a lot of resources together and she uh, put all the no-till and reduced to organic uh, information in the resource menu, in the information by topic, and there is videos of presentations we've given in the past as well as um, research results for every year. So if you want to see on a yearly basis what we tried and what was the best, um, and also a, a longer handout that Erin put together which gives what she, what she already presented, but in, in more detail. So there's a lot of information available, and I'm not going to talk about road rye anymore. Um, but I wanted to talk about the soybean into spring planted rice system. So one reason why I wanted to talk about it is that we finally made it work, so I'm pretty happy to share that we made it work. And the other reason is we had a pretty terrible fall, and I know a lot of you didn't plant rye last fall, so it's not, it's not a no-till system. Um, you, you pretty much still until you're going to plant. It's, it's more of a no cultivation system than a no till system. Um, and so it's based on the principle that rye does not vernalize, which means it uh, does not go to reproductive stages if it does not vernalize. And so vernalization means being exposed to low temperatures. And it's still a little unclear, and I, I get a lot of questions on that. Um, so yeah, again, we plant rye in the spring, so it's not going to go through reproductive stages, and it's, it's going to um, go to that stage, and it's not going to go further than that. So you're going to have the tillers, you know, the main suit, but the main suit is never going to have uh, a stem coming out of it. So it's, it's just, it is just grass. Uh, the seeding rates that we've been using for um, both, uh, for each year that I'm going to describe was two, uh, two bushel or two million, two million seeds, I think is a better... Uh, recommendations and two bushels because it's still variable depending on the test weight. And in terms of soybeans, we planted 325,000 seeds per acre. And I would not necessarily recommend going that high in that kind of system, but we have to do so because we're comparing our no-till system with that system, so we have to have the same seeding rate to, to give them a fair uh, treatment. So 2017. Um, I was, uh, what I was saying is, um, I don't know um, what is cold and how cold it has to be and how long it has to be cold for the rice to vernalize. And I've been trying to read as much as I could about it, and there is, there is really not a lot of information on it, and it seems to be very variety dependent. Um, but what I can tell you is that in 2017, um, we had some rye vernalize, and I'm going I'm to describe the conditions in which it was growing. So we we decided to drill the rye on April 12th to treat it as um, a spring planted small grain, so plant it as early as you possibly can without working your field wet. Um, and so plant it on, on April 12th. Um, on May 10th, we had uh, some weeds coming in. You can see how it looks like. So we had quite a bit of foxtail. Um, I think that it's foxtail growing in the, in the rye, so we tried to take care of it with a time weeder. Um, as Laura was saying, this was my uh, first year using a time reader. I, I was pretty terrified uh, of using it, so maybe I didn't go aggressively enough to uh, take care of that fox cell. Then we drilled the soybeans on May 26th, and that might have been our second mistake here, is to drill the soybeans instead of planting them. Um, we may, may have had better chance planting them, but we drilled them. And, and so what we had was... Um, First thing, we had rye regrowth because we had the no-till system the year before. So there was, um, as you can see here, as we were drilling the soybeans, you can already see this is rye that was regrowing from uh, the no-till uh, soybeans that we had the, the year before that. And the other thing we had was vernalized rye. So here you can see uh, the temperature, so the, the maximum air temperature and the minimum air temperature. The months here are written in French. So you have a little French lesson here. So between the, the 12th of um, April and the 12th of June, it's pretty easy to read, I guess. Um, and the, the line here in yellow is a 32 Fahrenheit degree, because when I think cold, I, I just think freezing point. So let's see how many times the, the blue line crossed that yellow line. Quite a couple of times, but it was only, you know, just one day, one night probably. Um, it froze. So it was one, two, three four, five, six, seven, seven times maybe again in June. 2017 was a pretty cool year in general. We never really had very high temperatures. And as Erin showed, the, the yield even in the, in the general, uh, in the normal soybean um, 
system were pretty low because I guess we didn't have quite enough growing degree days that year. So it looks like that much frost was enough for the rice to burn ice. That's how um, on June 19th, that's how the soybeans look like. I don't know if you see the soybeans, there are not a lot of them growing, so we had a, a stand issue, which I associate that to uh, drilling them as opposed to planting them. Um, but I wish we had uh, two treatments that year and we compared planting and drilling, but we didn't do it, so I don't really have the answer. And here's our vernalite rye. And I, I, I can make, the, I, we couldn't make the difference between um, the volunteer rye and the vernalite rye because this is July 3rd. And you see on July 3rd, the rye is only starting to head, and it, it went through emphasis after that. And so there was that rye that we planted in the spring, some of it vernalized, not all of it. So maybe that has to do with planting depth as well. And, and stuff that may have been planted deeper was not exposed to as much cold, so did not vernalize. But the, the rye that was a little shallower probably vernalized more than the rest. And I wouldn't be worried here about the competition of the vernalized rye with the soybeans. But again, it's always a problem of next year and how much rye we're going to put back into the system here. So in terms of yield, and the picture is not clear here, but we had so much topsoil as we could, um, as we could think that we were going to have it because you saw the picture that I showed you before, we already had a lot of topsoil growing with the rye um, right after planting it. Uh, so we had a large fractal invasion. We had a very low stand, 16,000 cents per acre. And the yield were, I mean, 20 bushels, you, don't, you really don't want to have 20 bushels of beans, but it's not that bad compared to the, the stand that we had. Pretty um, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these are pretty impressive plants. So they, they can really compensate for that low stand and really branch and like put out a lot of seeds per uh, plant. But I'm not calling that a success. It's, it was just an interesting uh, thing to, uh, to see. 2018. Um, so in 2018, um, the temperature rose pretty fast. So on May 1st, the soil temperatures were already uh, above uh, 50. And on May 8th, when we planted the rye, the soil temperature were above 50. Um, so I think Erin was trying to hold me back with that and try, trying to tell me to wait as long as I could to plant the rye, but I saw the temperature was rising and I got excited and I went ahead and planted the rye. And here was my mistake. Um, we only prepped the field. So we only had one flush of wheat. We did only one cell seed bedding that year. And I think that's what got us because we, so we did one till the second time. So we got rid of some wheat and then planted right away. So one cell seed bed, planted the rye. And on May 31st, as I was walking the field, this is what I could see. And you see that the broad leaves are pretty large, and you can you cannot get any wheat that big with a tiny meter. So we decided to um, stop the trial there, and, and and we filled it under. So we didn't have any spring planted rye in 2018. Um, but some farmers in central Wisconsin, uh, namely the Wallendals, um, had some of it that year. So they, they tried to plant the rye. The, the same day as the soybeans, five days before the soybeans, and ten days before the soybeans. And from their experience, what worked the best was to plant five days before or the day of. Was their planting date last? Oh, I can't remember. Probably early June. Yeah, yeah it was later. But it was kind of put together all these pieces of what changed. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in general, and Joel talked about this with planting days and not rushing it. So we don't have firm recommendations system, and I'm sure Leah will say, you cautious when trying this, and I'd like to hear other experiences if you're trying this technique, but it looks like, um, similarly, this is not a technique to push an earlier planting date, it's a technique to uh, eliminate the need for cultivation, but perhaps, as Leah was saying, waiting for those flushes of weeds to germinate, get in a good situation where that rye and the soybeans are going to establish quickly, and then planting, I, I, well, maybe more to the middle Early week of May, which is probably a bit too early. Yeah, well, that was definitely too early. Um, so, 2019, we decided to copy them and do uh, rye planted the same day as the soybeans or five days before. Um, we decided to do winter wheat as well um, because we went on some farms uh, with Brad the year before and we saw some farmers doing it with winter wheat. So, 
I thought why not comparing serial rye and winter wheat and see how they could um, work in that system. So five days before means that we planted the, the cereals on May 31st, and then we came back and planted the soybeans on June, June 5th, and then everything the same day was planted on, on June 5th. Um, we did a couple passes of pine weeding, and again, Tor also mentioned that. I don't know if we, we helped or hurt, but we decided to do it, and we didn't compare pine weeding versus no pine weeding, so I don't really have the answer to that either. And that's how, um, the, this is two days before pine weeding, so that the stage that we waited to, to go out in the field, we waited for both the cereal and the soybeans to be big enough to handle the pine weeder. So that's the day of pine weeding, how it looks like. And it's July 31st, and, and of course I took a picture of the best looking part of the field. Um, but actually a lot of the field um, of the, the, the planting everything the same day looks, looks great. And so that's how it looks on, on July 31st. So the rye is here under the soybean canopy, and this is September seeds. And so sometimes in, in August, the rye starts to naturally desiccate. So there is probably something in the genome of the plant that says that if it's, if it's not able to reproduce, then it can just go. <laughs> so it just, then in terms of management for after, you don't really have to worry about it because it's just going to look like this flat on the ground. So here we're comparing the, the weed control of this uh, different system. So here are, are the two uh, cereals planted five days before the soybeans. And here, uh, the same day as the soybeans. So control here is the uh, organic soybeans with, with uh, tillage. Control early is the one that we plant the same day as we plant our soybeans into, into our uh, standing rye. So that, that may have been planted on, on May uh, 15th when the rest was planted on, on June 6th. So in terms of weed control, so the A's are, are similar and the B's are similar. So you see that rye and wheat uh, planted five days before the soybeans didn't do as, as good in terms of weed control. And, and what I think um, is the explanation to that is that we had one more uh, cell seed, seed bedding planted, planting all, everything the same day. Um, so we actually did a lot of uh, cell seed bedding that year, and so for, for the control that was planted early, we only had one flock of weeds out of the system. For the things that were planted five days before the soybeans, we had two flushes of weeds, and for all of the others, control late and right, and we planted the same days as the soybeans, we had three flushes of weed out of the system, so three cell seed bedding, and I think that's what is explaining our difference in wood pressure here. Um, yeah, I'm saying that because the, so the cover crop biomass is not what is explaining what we're seeing in terms of wheat pressure and yield. Um, the, the cover crop biomass was the same, um, depend, no matter when we planted the, the, the small grain. Uh, what made a difference is the tire track. So wherever we drove over the rye or the wheat, the biomass was decreased. And the cover crop species made a difference, and actually the wheat produce more biomass than the rye. But these are pretty low numbers if you're remembering what Aaron said about the 8,000 tons of biomass that the rye produces when you plant it in the fall. And finally, the stem count and, and the yield. So the, the stem count here, you see it's higher than the control. So even with two passes of pine weeding, you're going to lose much less plants than if you um, do mechanical weeding all the way through the season. So that's why the 225 um, thousand seeds per acre, maybe you can lower your seeding rate and, and go a little closer to what you would generally do, or even lower than that, and, and still have uh, a good stem. And the yield, so the yields were pretty good for the rye planted the same day. They were comparable to um, both of the control. The wheat planted the same day was a little lower, but it was not significantly lower. And, and planted five days before um, it was significantly lower for the wheat, but not significantly lower for the rye. And I think, um, so again, the, the wheat produced more biomass, but I think what we're seeing here is the allopathic effect of the rye against the wheat that's also helping in that system. Should I do it or not do it? Yeah, let's just do, let's do those little corn and we'll take them. Okay. <laughs> so those are corn. Um, I'm going to try to go quickly. 
Um, so we've tried no-till corn for a couple of years, and, and it doesn't work. It hasn't worked for us uh, so far. Even this year, we are making progress every year, but we haven't gotten a decent yield yet. So what we tried this year, we had uh, two different cover crops, so we tried what we tell everyone not to try, is to plant corn into rye. Um, but the, the goal here was to plant some winter rye, so you see that the seeding rates are not as high as what we recommend for the no-till soybeans, because we hope that we're going to have some biomass from the winter peas. Of course, the winter peas winter kill, uh, so no winter peas, uh, but we still had a decent biomass of the rye here. We had 9,000 pounds of biomass, which is where you want to be. So we still reached that, that biomass that we wanted to have, and we, we decided to drill some, that was um, cross sitting or, or drilling some medium red clover into the rye to add some biomass and maybe add some nitrogen into the system. And the, the second cover crop that we tried was um, a year old stand of medium red clover that we had under seeded with a small grain the year before. And so we did it in two different fields. And that's part of a, of a larger trial uh, in which we're trying a lot of different types of equipment. So we have a termination trial where we try um, different ways of terminating a, a, the cover crop. So we tried a sickle bar mower, uh, two different rubber crimpers, and we compared crimping once uh, to crimping twice. And, and we also compared having roll cleaners and having no roll cleaners. And I'm going to show you a picture of what I'm calling roll cleaners here. And for the second cover crop, which was that year old stand of red clover, we undercutted the red clover to plant the corn into it. On the second field, we had a planter trial. So here we're playing with different planter settings into cover crop one, which was uh, the rye cover crop. So we decided to um, have a coulter or no coulter and try two different down pressures, a higher down pressure, a lower down pressure, and two different closing wheels. One was the uh, the rubber uh, wheel, and one was a, a down closing wheel. And what I also want to show you here is the um, field history. So in the, the field one had alfalfa that was terminated in 2016, and after that we had no-till soybeans and spring sense of small grain. And so the last time that field had any kind of N input was in 2016 um, when we planted, uh, we put manure on it. And, and the, the other field had alpha between 2012 and 2018 and had no other um, nitrogen input. So this is how uh, it looked like, planting the, the corn into, into the rye. And here is the roll cleaner versus no roll cleaner. So we wanted to see if we, got, we were going to help us or hurt us or, or hurt ourselves by giving more room to the corn but also giving more room to the wheat. So this is the roll cleaner that I'm talking about, and it's the one that comes with the dom roller crimper. So it's two, two discs and a shield that really clean the roll, as you can see here. Um, first problem that we had, and we knew that was going to happen, um, as we were planting, we could see army worm moths flying around, so that was not a great sign. And then we, um, we decided to scout after, and, and Annie remembers that she, she was working with us this summer, and, and we applied a pelletized poultry manure on top of the rye. So here we were digging into the rye on the poultry manure that was just a, just a dream. <laughs> and every, every time we went out and scouted, we could find army worms. So we, we decided to spray the OMRI approved um, insecticide to get rid of them. And it looked like it did a good job, but again, we didn't compare. So we don't know if they just went away naturally or if the, the insecticide did its job. Um, so this is how it looks like on July 1st. Uh, you can see in some places the clover really took off and kind of took a lot of room and, and kind of competed against the weeds. In some places, the weeds were really um, present on the road uh, quite early on. Oh yeah, the, the stem count here was um, was the best stem count we've, we've ever had in terms of uh, no-till corn. So the, the average was 26,000 plants per acre. We planted 38,000 seeds per acre. So it's not perfect, but it's better than what we had before, which was more around 10,000 plants per acre. And this is how it looks like on August 5th. So you definitely don't want to see that on your farm, I'm sure. Um, so half of the field, we decided to terminate it at that point because we didn't want to have a weedy mess uh, the following year. 
Uh, some of it we uh, kept it and, and harvested it for silage at the end of August, so very early on. And <clears throat> so the yield, um, oh, I don't have that here. And this, so this, all of what I showed you was field one. And if you remember, it's the one that didn't have uh, the alfalfa, and this is field two. And this is me probably setting it for the, what, what, what was going to become my uh, first harvest of organic no-till corn for grain. Um, so we actually brought it all the way to grain production. And so th that's the same system with the rolled-down rye and the clover into it. But somehow the field history was that alfalfa being there for many years and smothering the weeds and also bringing some nitrogen into the system probably helped us quite a bit. So the, the corn is not cold, the ears are not looking great. The average, average yield was 56 bushel per acre here, so it's not great, but it's better than nothing. And, and um, if you remember, this was a field in which we compared all these different center settings, and among all the different things that we compared, there was one thing that stand out, and that was the, the different closing wheels. So using um, a better design uh, closing wheel, so there was a, one of the down, I don't even know if it's commercialized, but Bill Bassett came with that closing wheel and he was very excited about trying it and it made a difference. So we had a, the, the rubber closing wheel gave us 41 bushel and, the, and the, the down closing wheel gave us 62 bushel. So these are not high yields, but I'm talking about a 20 bushel difference. And, and it's not something that we're really observing in soybeans. Uh, so corn is much stickier in terms of uh, feeding uh, seed bed preparation than, than, than soybeans are and, and having um, the right tools seems to really help in this system. Uh, this is the cover crop too, so the year old ten of meter red clover. We use a suck up high residue cultivator to terminate, uh, to undercut bends of clover, so we offset everything to make, to make it match the corn rows. Uh, we went two inches deep, and so this is how it looked like after. So we use the stock of high residue cultivator in addition to uh, the roll cleaners on the <coughs> on the crimper. July first, and <laughs> and this is when we we hoped we would get the the roll mow to start mowing between the rows to give as much sense as we could to to the corn, but we didn't get it um, as early as we wanted to. So the corn started to uh, the the clover started to take over the field. Um, but we, we, so we had the Roma on July 12, and we went through it. So you see the corn is here. The sand was pretty good, um, 26,000 cents per acre, I think. Um, and in terms of yield, so that the stuff that we harvested at the end of August for silage. And so here we had, we had five, uh, five tons of dry matter per acre. And if we compare to in, in that same field, we had a control corn that we had cultivated all the way through. And so that control corn gave us seven tons. So we were two tons under planting into the clover. So I think that, in my opinion, this is a, a promising system and I'm really excited to work more on it and have uh, either the row more or roll between the rows uh, on the timing matter to give more, more chance to the corn to, to get to there.